Hi there. Um, I'm Sue Wasserman, co-president of the Citrus Native Plant Society. Uh, say hi in the comments if you're out there and please go ahead and, and ask any questions that you want to in the comments box at the bottom. And then we will bring those questions up after the program or after the uh, presentation. If you have any questions during the meeting, go ahead and bring them up and uh, Athena will bring those, those questions up on for us and we'll do what we can to answer them. I wanna thank all of our volunteers who are out there doing great work. Uh, we still have a lot of projects out throughout the county and um, those volunteers are making things happen. Uh, you may have noticed in the email that we sent out earlier in the uh, earlier in the week that we are looking to see whether we can have enough volunteers to run a plant sale in April. Normally we have our plant sale in March, uh, but we figured it'd probably be a good idea to delay it about a month. And then we also are gonna run it as a drive-through plant sale. So people will be able to drive their cars through the area and then we can load the, the plants directly to them. And we're not gonna have any live sales there or on-site sales. But we do still need a lot of volunteers to help offload the plants, sort the plants, and then uh, deliver the plants to the people who are driving through. If you would be available to volunteer on a Friday in April, please let us know. Send an email to us at, let me see, I have a banner that I can bring up that has our, there we go. Oh, and now that's our website. Um, I don't have a banner for that one. Uh, but anyway, citrusnps at gmail.com. So if you would please send us an email, that's where the where you got the, uh, there we go, Athena took care of me. Uh, yeah, citrusnps at gmail.com. Send us an email, let us know that you would be, you plan to be available or you would, would volunteer if you happen to be available on that day. And then we can see if we've got enough volunteers to go ahead and run a plant sale because nothing runs without volunteers. That's why we love them so much. Um, speaking of volunteers, we do still have demo gardens out there around the county. Um, we plan a new demo garden and we're working with the friends of Fort Cooper State Park. We've got two small projects out there that we plan to get done. One of them will be done this uh, winter and then we hope to get another one going in the springtime. They are available to help us, but of course we always love our Native Plant Society members to come out and help plant stuff. So let us know if you'd be available to do that as well. Um, there'll be more information coming out when we plan those days. We used to have a demo garden in the uh, Inverness, right by the Inverness County Courthouse, um, but the whole city garden um, or community garden idea apparently did not take well enough. And so all of those gardens have been turned over to the key center. So we no longer have a demo garden out there, but we do still have our Lacanto demo garden and it's likely to need some work coming up in February. And we still have our demo gardens at uh, Church House and at the um, at the uh, State Park at the Crystal River State Park. Um, wanted to say a big thank you to Deb Daniels who gave us two years as vice president, and welcome Donna Carrigan who will be taking her place as the vice president. And a quick reminder to everybody out there that the rest of us on the board are going to be termed out after this year. So we're gonna need some new people to come in and take our places. So if you're interested at all, please be, um, in taking a, a leadership role in this Native Plant, Native plant uh, chapter, please let us know. We'd love to have somebody um, to mentor during the year and that way, if you run for the position and end up getting it, then you already know you, what you need to do. Um, you're a step ahead. All right, as far as membership, we've got about 121 people and that includes the 14 people who are also in the Tri-County chapter. 
So we are down some memberships. If your membership is up, please make sure to renew it and continue supporting the Native Plant Society. All right, we do have a walk coming up on Friday. And DeBolt and Roger Rosentrader, who are lichen specialists, um, are going to be walking through the Gulf Coast and uh, pine scrub there and identify whatever varieties of lichens they find. Um, the attendance is limited and we got a great number of people already signing up. So if you are interested, make sure that you um, RSVP with Ben Barauer. You can email him, call him, or text him at the number on the screen there, but you need to let him know that you're going to be there so that um, our hosts can plan accordingly. In a month from now, on February 2nd, our next chapter meeting will be at 7 o'clock, and Nancy Bissett, who authored co-authored The Native Plants for Florida Gardens, will be telling us a little bit about her book and giving us a couple of excerpts. Please make sure to regularly check our Facebook page and our website calendar because we may have some short notice events and any of the details of any events that you're interested in are on that website on the calendar. Plus we list interesting events uh, that other chapters are hosting, whether it's uh, their chapter meeting or some of their own plant walks. So next, let's present Athena, and she's going to bring up the plant of the month. She's going to present red cedar. So let me take down that there. There we go. Hey, Athena. Hey, Sue. Gotcha. All right. I'm going to give it all to you. Take it away. All right. So um, for... January being uh, Florida's Arbor Day, I thought picking a tree would be kind of good. And we're also featuring trees for our speaker tonight. So I picked red cedar. And there's two reasons why I kind of like uh, red cedars. One is that it was one of the first plants that I learned the Latin name for. And it's a nice, easy to pronounce Juniperus virginiana. Um, the second reason why I like uh, red cedar is that it's one of those plants that there's still little ongoing debate as to what exactly we have here. Um, so there are some that just say that it's eastern red cedar, and there are some that say that it's uh, a variety of eastern red cedar, and then there are some that say that what we have in Florida is a totally different species of red cedar tree. The Florida Plant Atlas doesn't really divide it as uh, species or subspecies, and I kind of follow them. Um, they do mention that if it, uh, if you follow uh, Adams, he says that it's probably Juniperus virginiana variety uh, Sicilicola, um, which is uh, what most people that I know kind of uh, consider what we have here in uh, Florida mostly would be the southern red cedar, uh, not eastern red cedar. Um, a little side note is the Latin name Sicilicola actually means growing in sand. So that kind of makes a little bit of sense um, for us here in Florida. So the tree is kind of common, but it's very useful and it has a lot of cool little things about it. Um, it's normally naturally found in coastal sand dunes and marshes, um, but it doesn't like an overabundance of water and it's very drought tolerant. Um, it's evergreen, which makes it really nice. It's somewhat aromatic. The shape to it is kind of a conical pyramid with some easy drooping branches. It needs no pruning, no maintenance. I see some people prune them up so they have a space underneath them, but you don't even have to do that. The light and the moisture levels are very forgiving. It takes a lot of different ranges. It can get kind of wide when it gets mature. Um, you can plant them very close together and get like a hedge, but um, they'll get up to 30 feet wide. I've got a couple that are in the 20s of range right now. Very high salt tolerance. Uh, as you can tell, it's a coastal plant, so it takes uh, salt spray and it takes salt soil too. The hardiness zone goes up into the United States, so we have no problems there. The flowers are kind of inconspicuous and yellow. Uh, they happen in the spring during March and May. The, uh, the fruits are blue when they're mature, 
but they're actually not fruits because as a conifer, they don't have fruits. They have fleshy cones. All conifers, uh, they, they don't really flower. They don't really fruit his cones. And then the wildlife benefits are several. Um, the, the fruits uh, feed birds and small mammals, and the birds will use foliage for cover and shelter because the insides are so open, it's easy to duck inside of them and have a lot of perching place. Um, butterflies also shelter in the interior. Uh, we once heard that monarchs during the migration will seek out uh, red cedar because it's so open on the inside and it creates like a little micro habitat where it stays a little warmer. And then it's also a larval host for the olive butterfly, which is native to Florida. Oh, and I forgot, this is a picture I took um, on my tree outside, it's a picture of a native uh, mantis egg sac. So there's critters using it. Now the- um, Athena, we're not seeing any of the pictures. You didn't see any of the pictures. No, no, here, let me, uh, there we go. Sorry, there okay. we go. All right, so this is the native mantis right there, if you can mm -hmm. see that. Um, it's, you know, kind of nondescript. And I have seen some people find uh, hummingbird nests inside of them because they're kind of open, but I haven't had that luck yet. Then the uh, benefits, as far as people go for them, uh, they're often used to screens and hedges because they grow so dense. Uh, I'm kind of doing that a little bit myself. Uh, they make an excellent background tree, serve as a backdrop to other plants. The wood is very strong. It's used for fence posts, cedar chests, um, all sorts of woodworking. And then the Christmas tree growers down here often use red cedar because of its nice conical shape. It does have hurricane wind resistance, so hopefully we'll hear about it a little more later on. Um, and the Native Americans did definitely use juniperus for uh, food and they used it medicinally. I can't speak to uh, exactly how um, uh, accurate <laughs> it might have been used medicinally, but it does have a very potent antiviral compound in the fruits and the needles. Um, it's been proven to be effective against viruses like the flu and herpes. I can't pronounce it. If you can see it, uh, you can kind of maybe Google that, um, but I'm not even gonna try pronouncing it. Um, and those berries of Eastern and red, red, excuse me, Southern red cedar can be used like juniper berries because they are juniper berries. Um, but the foliage while used um, for northern species, it's the species we have here in, in Florida, you can't use it. Um, so don't make peas out of it or anything like that. And uh, the berries are used for flavoring, um, you can use it such as stuffing and marinades and stews. Um, in Europe, they use it in sauerkraut, and they also make a really dark syrup made out of the berries. Um, the, the cocoa fruits um, can have as much as 30% sugar in some species. So uh, if you're interested, the mature fruits are blue, and you might want to try them sometime next time if you happen to have a, a juniper fruit show up on one of your uh, red cedars. And then uh, a lot of people do know the, the, are familiar with the fruit because it's uh, used in gin, and gin was also originally invented as a diuretic medicine. So it, it's been used for a long time for medicinal uses. Um, I've even heard that uh, the English may have had protective benefits in Africa from malaria because of uh, quinine being in juniper as well. Um, or, I think it was in juniper. I know the quinine's in gin, but maybe it wasn't in juniper. Actually, the quinine was in the tonic water for ah, the gin and tonics. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, so it's a good all around medicinal drink. But, um, so I haven't yet used juniper berries in anything, and I really have been kind of dying to. Um, my trees haven't really seemed to produce any fruits, but I have a neighbor's that does. So I'm going to try to sneak over next year and make a point. Uh, as my New Year's resolution this year to do something with some juniper berries and uh, see how they taste. All right. Well, I have used juniper berries in um, the brine that I soak my turkey in when I do a turkey brine for Christmas or Thanksgiving. Awesome. Usually throw a couple, uh, take a couple of the dried berries, bruise them a little bit, and I throw those into the brine. Yeah. Yeah, so it adds a nice little flavor. Um, we did have a question as you were talking. Would you please say again the scientific name of the plant and 
would you um, explain again the issue about the Eastern versus Southern and what does that do as far as the name? Well, that's because, you know, the botanists that are uh, much higher pay scale than me, um, they are, this, they still haven't decided yet. It's, there's no collective wisdom on it. Um, the red cedar general Latin name is Juniperus virginiana. Some people argue that what we have mostly in Florida is a separate species. There's not a lot of differences between the two trees, um, but they're, mostly the berries are smaller on the uh, what's considered the southern red cedar. But um, it's either a separate species or it would be a variety of Juniperus virginiana. If it's a variety, then the eastern red cedar would be considered Juniperus virginiana variety virginiana, and the southern red cedar would be Juniperus virginiana variety sicilicola. Um, I think that would answer it. But it could be a whole separate okay. species, in which case it would be Juniperus sicilicola. Okay, got it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And definitely, uh, I need to use more red cedars in my landscape and uh, look, look forward to hearing more about them from Andrew. They are excellent. The only, I should mention, the only thing that's bad about them is if you have like apple trees, um, they can, they're one of the species that moves the cedar apple rust back and forth between apple trees. So that is something to consider it, but apples don't really grow that well in Florida. Anyway, so. I, I think the cedars are a better way. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Athena. Appreciate your presentation. Yeah, have fun. Talk to you later. Um, also, while Athena was talking, I saw a comment back from Ben about our walk on Friday, and he said that we've got 10 people signed up so far, and uh, that Roger and Anne will each take eight people so that we can have some social distancing. So that means a total of 16. So we've got six more slots available, but that's only six slots. So please get a hold of Ben and let him know if you want to join us. Um, so next, we have Andrew Koser. He's a PhD. He's an associate, of, pro, associate professor of urban tree and landscape management at the University of Florida Gulf Coast Research and Education Center near Tampa. Andrew is the author of several Florida-specific tree identification guides and is a widely recognized expert on trees and their response to storms. Beyond this, he's the father of four amazing daughters and companion to an okay basset hound. And I know that I've seen in the background a kitty cat running by. So please welcome Andrew. Hello, hello. Hey. So let me get this um, slideshow. Okay. Are you seeing my first slide in full? Let me add it to the stream. There we go. You're on. Okay. Now I will not be able to see you. So I'm just going to go in there blind and hope I'm. Uh, Striking a chord with folks. So yes, my name is Andrew Kozer. I'm at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center uh, in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, feel blessed to be here. It was like the job and location lottery, and, and I love it. Got to spend a lot of time over the holidays on the beach, and um, even though I've been here for nearly a decade, it, it never gets old. Uh, another thing that doesn't get old are just the beautiful trees in the area. This is uh, the Baranoff Oak in Safety Harbor. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Uh, there's a fence around it, and that fence is not to keep uh, people away from dangerous trees. It's to keep people from loving the tree to death. Um, you know, we, we love trees, and we just trample around them and suffocate their roots. And, and, and it's usually the big ones that suffer the fate from our, our affection for them. Um, so the name of my talk today is called Bending But Not Breaking, Selecting and Caring for Trees in Hurricane Prone for Florida. So... Uh, we'll talk about some species that have research behind them that shows that they are resilient to wind and, and storm events. Um, and you'll see that the pellets are uh, not extremely rare because to do these kinds of studies, to do research on trees like this, you need to have a population of them to, to look at. You need to have replication. So um, there'll be things that are probably in your yard or in your neighbor's yard, which is good because you'll be able to make judgments on whether or not that species is resilient or not, and um, plan accordingly. I will say that 
um, when we talk about selecting trees for anything, the more criteria you put on a tree to select for. So you want something that's flowering, salt tolerant, you know, drought resistant, you know, as soon it gets harder and harder to find diversity. And diversity is the game that we want to play when we talk about urban forestry because right now we have a lack of that in our our, our, our cities and towns. The average city in the United States has six species that make up over 60 to 70% of their canopy, you know, and then it just takes one pest to wipe out 10, 15% of the trees that are in a, a city. And that has a tremendous impact on our lives and how we enjoy our livelihood. So please do, you know, be very judicious when you select things for, for select for things. Cause if you say you were on a board or something like that and you said, we are only having wind resistant trees in my town or my HOA, all of a sudden you've limited the palette and you limit the diversity that we need to um, deal with threats and pests and things that are coming in the state every day. So um, a lot of this information comes from the trees and hurricanes um, website that was up for the University of Florida. It looks low dated, but this stuff is, um, you know, from 2014 and on, um, uh, recently updated. I actually have some money from the Forest Service. They want us to completely redo this and we'll have videos and have it more um, up to today's standards when it comes to content delivery. So, um, but a lot of the stuff that I will be talking about just highlights a lot of the wealth of information that's on this, this website if you're interested in it. So, um, how do we know what trees resist hurricanes? A lot of this work comes from my predecessor, Mary Derrier. She was also um, a dean in my college when I first was hired. Um, she, over the course of her very long and productive career in Florida, tracked storms uh, throughout the Gulf Coast and even Puerto Rico, looking to see what the, the outcome of the storm was. Um, and, and I've carried on this work and I've altered the methods a little bit. I'll talk about that in a, later on in the section. But she was just you know doing rapid responses, seeing what was on the ground, and looking for patterns of failures uh, in trees throughout this region. So a lot of this information comes from her. There's there's data to behind this, which is nice. So we we're really you know we're taking some of the anecdote that you know arborists and their enforcers had already from their collective knowledges, and putting data behind it to justify our assessment of what trees are resilient and not. So I'm going to start with the most resistant trees. I, I played around with the wording on this. I didn't know if it was like very resistant or the most or whatever, because these are really coarse groupings. But from this work, from my work and others, we can say that these trees are about as bulletproof as trees can get. And no tree is completely safe. Even a stump can trip someone, right? So we want to make sure that um, we, we don't have too high expectations of these things. But a lot of these are pretty tough trees nonetheless. So uh, I'll talk with, you know, I stuck with natives with this um, for sure. And, you know, this one might be one that is familiar to some of you, but not all of you. This is black gum or Nilsa sabbatica. Nilsa sabbatica, it is a beautiful tree. If you get a cold year, this thing will have like a really nice red color, which is pretty impressive um, and, and pretty underutilized. It's a swamp species. Anytime you see black in the name for a, uh, uh, you know, a common name or nigra in the Latin name, you can tell that that thing is probably something that comes from a wet environment, right? Those, I, I love common names. I know they're not, they're problematic in many ways, but there's a lot of like kind of folk knowledge that gets tied up in them. And um, I, I think we can't discount that. So, so being, you know, water to tolerant, it also makes a very good urban tree because Urban sites tend to be compacted in low oxygen soil environments and having stomped on soil is nearly the same as having waterlogged soil, right? So whenever we look at some of our iconic street trees like elms in the north and, um, you know, other things like that, you know, down here, we, they tend to be riparian trees and, and water loving trees. Um, so this is, as you can see, it has a very up and down form, doesn't require a lot of maintenance. This is what we call a tree with really high apical dominance, which gives it that almost coniferous form, that X current form that you see there. And it'll be maintained up into maturity when it finally starts breaking that and, and kind of becoming fuller in the crown higher up. Um, 
Uh, what else? Oh, so it has a really nice fall color when you have a cold snap. It'll have uh, some really bright reds. Reds that will rival um, even, you can see that one leaf has a little bit of red. It'll rival your red maples up north and, and stuff like that. The only problem is when it comes to fall color, red is not a consistent color in the south. You actually need some sort of chilling um, and sunlight, a combination of sunny days and cold weather to really produce that red color. And that's something we don't can get consistently in Florida. If you're looking for consistent fall color, anything that I say that has yellow or has um, brown, like, like the bald cypresses, those have consistent color down here, which is really cool if you want that fall show. Um, and then maybe put one of these in there for the occasional splash of red that you'll get. Uh, another one that is not a stranger to any of us here, but it, it, it's loved for a good reason, is a southern magnolia. You know, um, this another pyramidal tree, right, um, with deep glossy um, leaf tops, and and the ones that are cultivated in production have that really velvety, rusty pubescence underneath the leaf. So it's really con a nice contrast. You know, if you go to like older plantings, older landscapes, I was walking around USF campus on some of the older parts, you'll see some that don't have that pubescence underneath that, that they're almost like a pale or green. But everything that you see in cultivation now from the major nurseries, they've selected for that, that fuzziness that gives it just another bit of, of flair year round. Um, and then again, this thing has a show when it flowers, it's grand flora, which again would be, if you, if you know anything of land, Latin, it's going to be big flower, right? Um, and, and it lives up to its name. These things are massive and this, the, the fruit, which I don't have in here, I ran out of room cropping, um, also is quite spectacular. It's like a red, um, cluster of fruit that will come right off the tip of that the flower. Um, so bald cypresses are, are gaining more popularity. I love these trees. I do find that they're a little hard to transplant, but once they're established, they're rock solid. These things have a massive range going from Southern Illinois to Florida. Um, and they're just like an iconic Florida species, especially when you think of going across the Everglades, Alligator Alley 41 and seeing those cypress hammocks. They just, I, I love this tree. Um, you know, newbies, uh, you hear these horror st stories of like folks moving to a new yard, seeing their pine tree brown up in the fall and, and die before their eyes and then they cut it down over the winter. Um, so that, uh, you know, I, I hope the audience knows that, that to be patient because this thing will leaf out in the spring. It'll have some really bright green foliage when it first emerges and, and just be a showstopper. Um, from that, I, I love the color of this thing when it first kind of emerges. Um, it, its fruit is, is a cone that just kind of disintegrates, so it's not messy from that regard. Um, but on on some sites, it'll develop knees, and these knees are these little, um, you know, these poking kind of rocky outcroppings coming around the base of the tree that just kind of pop up around. And this only occurs on wet sites. And again, low oxygen sites that are compacted. So this picture right here where all those knees are forming uh, is in Hyde Park in Tampa, a very wealthy neighborhood that had a pretty bad drainage problem for a long time because it was built on a swamp and the drainage um, you know, pipes were, were breaking down with age. Um, there was actually cattails next to that thing growing through the papers. It was pretty impressive. Um, but they wanted trees that would survive in this wet environment and some brave neighbors were putting cypress up because they they wanted a tree in their yard. Uh, sorry about that. I have four dollars, and that's one that likes to roast me quite a bit. Um, so, um, as you can see here, uh, these things are kind of a problem if you want to mow, and, and that's often a question you'll get: is how do I mow around my tree when these knees are all everywhere? And I would say, why would you want to mow? You know, just put. A ground cover in there, maybe some jasmine or a native ground cover, if you, you know, perennial peanut, anything um, to make it less maintenance and to, um, you know, let you enjoy these these cool anomalies. You know, we don't even know what these knees do. You know, when you talk about metaphors for mangroves, those things serve a function that we're aware of, right? We know that they help bring oxygen lower to the root because roots need to breathe. 
we have no idea what these things do. Every study to see if there's oxygen movement in these things has failed. Um, they don't produce offspring. They're not like some sort of sucker popping up. Um, some people hypothesize that they could be uh, like a prehistoric defense mechanism against giant herbivores, or they could be um, some sort of strategy for bust buttressing these things in soggy soils that would give away otherwise, right? So um, I, I do want to test that ladder theory. I, I want I have a block of these. I'm going to flood half of them and keep the other ones so they don't produce needs, then flood the entire site and start pulling them over for tractor to see if that, that ladder theory holds true. Um, so pond cypress, I love, it's like a lesser known Baldwin, Baldwin brother, or like, um, you know, uh, maybe a, a Wahlberg, you know, like he's, you know, the main ones, but you, you, oh, this one's pretty cool too. Right. Um, I love pond cypress. It's, it, it's another one of those things where the name means something. So taxodium ascendance, right. Ascending. You look at the foliage in this picture versus that one where it's drooping down. In a taxodium ascendance, especially the new growth, you have that kind of reaching for the sun kind of look in the foliage, which is a dead giveaway for why this is different than its its cousin. Um, the other thing with taxodium ascendance or pond cypress is that this thing can handle really low oxygen demand in the soil, a lot of availability actually. Um, and what that means is that it, it can grow in like stagnant water, like a pond, right? Whereas bald cypress might be more towards like a flowing stream or something like that. So um, yeah, it's pretty cool tree. If you are over bald cypress because it's been gaining a lot of appreciation from contractors and even like FDOT and other major planters of trees and you want to get something similar, but a little, a little different, a little to show your, your friends and family, uh, I would recommend pond cypress. Again, a little finicky in my experience, trying to transplant, um, but once they're established, they, they just are rock solid. Again, uh, still on the really resilient trees, the hollies. So I just kind of tossed the three big ones. I, I guess Palaka, East Palaka would be in there too, but we didn't have enough reps in our data to show that that one was, um, you know, resilient to winds. But so Ilex Cassine, that'd be the Dehun holly, Ilex Opaca, the American holly, and then Ilex Vomitoria, an, a cool name, but kind of a misnomer, would be the Yupon holly. I'm sure everyone here knows about the Yupon holly. Um, it, it's caffeinated, and um, it was uh, uh, used to make like a, like I think they call it black drink or some sort of tea by the native folks um, prior to um, our, you know, in, in, prior to and during European colonization. Europeans saw them drinking it. And uh, there's there's a lot of debate on this, kind of like what's a red cedar. We don't really know, but um, they do think that um, it might have been used in cleansing ceremonies, and that would involve vomiting the the fluid back up, which is where the vomitory comes from. But the settlers, kind of, if if that theory holds true, saw it as a drink that makes them vomit. But there's no proof that it actually is something that would make you nauseous if you drink. Um, it's just a caffeinated beverage. That's um, people we use to make tea now. So here is, of course, a live oak. This is a massive tree. They can grow to be 120 feet wide. So this is not for everyone's yard, right? And people love this tree. They love to plant it in four foot planting spaces. They love to plant it right next to their house. And it can live for 500 years, just growing bigger and bigger towards whatever you don't want it to grow, right? So you have to, you have, to have space for this thing. And this tree right here, I love this tree because it shows two different things. It shows if you just let trees be, they will recover. This tree, you know, trees don't grow into the ground like that on that right-hand side. That tree had a failure in the trunk, started to pull away and landed on the ground and just stuck there and it kept growing, you know. And we don't let that happen enough in urban areas. We Once a tree tips over, we're right there with the chainsaw, cutting it down. When you can have the most interesting trees you want to take a picture of when they actually do stuff like this, you know. And I, I love that. Another thing I like about this tree is it's not one tree. You can see it's three, maybe four different trees planted very, very close together. We get so caught up in like planting spaces for trees, you know, based on their 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 growth, that we forget that these things grow in close proximity 
in the forest. And then they battle it out. Some win, some don't. This one just happened to be a little bit of a clump where it essentially made one giant tree out of four separate ones. And if you, you know, like, I don't think anyone's intentionally planted in this way <laughs> to make this happen. These are just the remnants from pre-settlement that just somehow survived development in our, in our urban areas, you know? Um, the, you know, the, the live oak, um, they, they are rock solid. Like, uh, they're, they're one of our most significant shade trees in the area. They're fire resistant, they're drought resistant, and they are wind resistant. And, and that has a lot to do with their wood strength. Um, live oak scrap, your little cousin is sand live oak or Quercus geminata. Again, if you're, you're over what's most common, you want something a little bit different, um, or if you want um, just something a little smaller, because this thing does not get as big as live oak, sand live oak might be an option for you. Um, like the live oak, it has like a revolute leaf, which it, this one, this picture shows it better. So that's what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, like people often want to know, how do you tell a laurel oak from a live oak from a, a sand live oak? So it comes down in a lot of ways to the revoluteness of the leaves. And this, this has variation. Oaks like to trick people, but a laurel oak will have a flat papery leaf. A live oak will have a little bit of cupping around the edge of the leaf, kind of going towards the downside. And you can see here, these sand live oaks have a very distinct cupping that almost makes the leaf look like a teaspoon, right? And that re that revoluteness, that curling is a giveaway for this species. The bark um, is blocky too, uh, but that could be easily confused with live oak and then size being another thing. Um, so. Yeah, uh, uh, I love this tree. I think this was, in all of Derrier's research, this was the most resilient th because it's just as rock solid as in, in its wood as live oak, but it's not as tall. And the taller you get, the harder it is to um, combat the winds that are higher up. Um, so that had it going for it. Um, and also it's, it's a little rare, so I could see that it wouldn't be picked up in um, the data as much as failing, so. Um, other oaks that are um, resistant to failure during storms would be the turkey oak, myrtle oak. Um, both are a little scrubby. Um, you know, myrtle oaks really, it, I, I've seen it as a small tree. There's actually a park nearby on the Little Manti River that has a couple decent sized myrtle oak. I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty impressive, but mostly it's kind of a, a, a bush or an unretrieving tree, as I could call it. Um, Turkey oak, um, they can look good, um, but often when the ones that you see planted in the landscape, just after maybe 10 years, they start to, to get a little rough. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's the stock or the sites or whatever, but I it, you see them best in, in the wild, it seems like. Um, so all those oaks I talked about, they're really good um, for, for wildlife. If you love squirrels, if you love deer, I mean, with turkey, they are the, like the, the lifeblood of the forest feeding everything. And I, what I love about oaks, too, is that they, they're they smart in that they have a mast year. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, where they produce like a, a certain amount of acorns every year, um, you know, like a low level for maybe two, maybe three years. And then, boom, in one year, everything in the forest just produces as many acorns as it can. It has a bumper crop. And all the little critters in the forest, they can eat as much as they want. They won't get them all. And that leads to, like, the generation that's going to make it and, and succeed and, and lead to the future growth of the forest. And that's pretty cool that that happens. And then just the sinking, I just don't know how it works. And I'm not sure if that's clear. So um, so these are wind-resistant trees. These are not the, the all-stars I just showed you before, but they still have a, a decent level of wind resistance. We're, you know, we, we kind of grouped them into four groups of like super ruin resistant pretty wind resistant okay and then poor and i'm going to show you the the semi wind resistant next and then the the ones that just are not very um good when it comes to hurricanes and, and derechos and, and high wind storms so this is a, a tree my kids love this is pig nut hickory or caria glaba um again the the nut is bitter and not very good for eating unless you're a pig which is where the name comes or another woodland creature that just wants to survive right 
But for humans, they would probably be something they would call in a book um, edible but not palatable, which means to me not not edible, right? Um, they have a compound leaf um, where you ha often have the leaf where it'll um, be, you know, the asymmetrical leaves off to the side, and then um, often it'll um, be kind of fatter down lower in the picture, as you see there, than the, you know, the, the fattest part of the leaf is towards the tip um, for that leaflet. It has a cool flower that um, is not very showy, but if you get up close with a macro lens, it, it's got something to, 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 to look at, you know. Um, and it, it doesn't have the kind of iconic you know, like bark that you would think of with a shag bark hickory, but um, this is just a, a, a tall growing rock solid tree. That if you like wildlife, you want something to mix with the oaks well, pignut hickory could be your tree. Uh, my kids love it because too when those um sorry when those sh when those nuts split or you know to hiss and break open, it kind of looks like a pig nose too. So I'm not sure um, if that's the namesake for the the pig nut or if it's um, what I read earlier today about them being just unfit for eating by humans. So um, this is my favorite tree. This thing is called musclewood, blue beech, hornbeam, American hornbeam, ironwood. It goes by many names, which is the downside of common names is that they can sometimes be um, ambiguous or just interchangeable, right? Um, but musclewood the, is the way I learned it, right? And, and I like that because if you look in that picture all the way to the right, it has a, just a very unique, you know, diameter growth pattern and thin bark, which gives the stems an appearance of muscles, you know, these gray almost like something you'd see on like an elephant's leg, you know. Um, they they go by um, hop hornbeam too, not sometimes um, because they have the hop-like fruits. Um, this is a tree that can get um, some red as well, red not being a very dependable color in Florida. Um, and I just love double serrate leaves. I just, another one that has a Mar river birch. I love how you have serrations on serrations and that that's just like a little bit of pattern and um, almost like fractalness that I love in plants. So um, this tree is super strong, very slow growing. So it's it's typically an understory plant, um, but it it the wood is just like if you cut it and drop it, it sounds like a cinder block. It's pretty cool. So uh, another plant. Um, that people like if they like edible plants, although edible is debatable or just down to timing on this one, is persimmon. Um, the, if you don't get it when it's ripe, it's very stringent and very tough to eat, dumps your mouth. Um, but when you get it when it's ripe, it's supposed to be very good. I've just never been that lucky, apparently. But um, Dial Spiros is Latin for the food of Zeus. So apparently it, it trips someone's trigger, it makes them really happy. I have never had a persimmon. I was just like, yes, I, I'm, I'm glad I ate that. I'm glad I put that in my mouth, you know? Um, but uh, I love the bark on this thing. Look at that. It's just like cracked mud or, um, you know, some sort of volcanic surface. Just very impressive. This was a large specimen in Illinois when I, where I lived before I moved down here. Um, Chickasaw plum. Um, this is one of the many, many buried plants in Florida that is apparently edible when you put a lot of sugar in it to make it a an, a pie or a jelly. <laughs> so um, it, you know, it's it's pretty showy for a non cultivated plant with these these beautiful white flowers. Um, definitely, you can tell that it's of the prunus family with the bark. You know, with those big lentils. Um, and it, you know, this is more of a shrub species. I think the shrubbiness probably helps it in, in assessments of hurricane damage because it's not going to have any big failures, you know, even if it's losing branches and stuff, they're going to be small branches that you're not going to pick up in your data. So, and that, that bodes well for homeowners too. Like it, this thing's not going to get big enough to have a major failure that's going to cause property damage or be something that you would notice visually in your yard. Um, so another smaller stature tree that it's, it's got that visual appeal of flowers is the flowering dogwood, Cornus, Florida. So, um, the flower in this, I don't know why everyone has to say this, but I'm going to say it myself. The flower is the little yellow part 
in the center of that white shape. The white part is the bract or like the, the kind of leaves that go around the um, flower. But on this plant, they're white, which essentially makes it a bigger flower. But um, botanists like to make those kind of distinctions um, when they nerd out. And I fell to that trap today for this, <laughs> this call. Uh, another tree that has fruit, like the the, um, uh, the Chickasaw plum before it, uh, this is mostly a wildlife tree with those fruit, but they 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 have a seasonal beauty to them, right? When you have flowers, flowers tend to be pretty for a while and fade, whereas fruit persists longer generally, giving you a more seasonal uh, flair um, through the fall and into the winter, you know? Again, this thing can have um, some pretty showy fall color if conditions allow, which isn't often. often. Um, the bark's pretty spectacular when it gets big enough to, to break like that. Um, uh, the leaves, I just, I love the venation on these things. It, it's a dead giveaway with the, with the dogwoods when you have that kind of venation that kind of traces the outer edge of the leaf. Um, another dead giveaway when trying to identify this thing is it's one of the few alternate, um, trees out there. I mean, I mean, opposite, sorry, opposite. So when you play guess who with like your kids and stuff, you know, when, when you get Something like the guy with glasses, you're like excited because it really limits the possibilities. That's the same thing when it comes to identification. When you have things that are opposite, it makes it a lot easier. When you have things that are whorled, you know, having multiple branches come from the same node, like three or more, then it really makes your life easy. Everything else is alternate and it's, and it's hard to identify, but that, that's one that I like for that reason. Wind prone trees. Um, these are things that tend to fail more than most and i'm going to show you that more than most doesn't mean that they're going to fall over and, and kill you right so if you have any of these in your yard do not worry unless you have to worry right and we'll talk about that in a little bit um this is just i figured i'd show it um and just to make folks aware and to know uh what they should look into so sorry <laughs> athena <laughs> red cedar um if, at least from the research that i've been looking at is uh, and, and the the, um, the Tampa tree matrix, which which summarizes a lot of it, um, is considered low a tolerance of wind. Um, but I, I, it's not like a full tree failure. I've seen I, there's a couple of these in my park next door, and we had a, a straight line wind that kind of went through early in the year, and they lost branches, right? They they and that would be picked up as a failure in the data sets that we collect, but they didn't tip over. Right, you don't have a whole tree failure with these. That's going to cause um, property damage or, or death or anything like that. Um, but when you lose a branch, it's going to be a bare spot for a while. But luckily, red cedar are hedging species. They're one that you can cut back, and they'll sprout at vicious growth, and, and epicorn branches will break or buds will break loose, and it'll produce new growth wherever light's touching. And that's cool because that gap will heal in it fill in again right and they're very rot resistant too like they use them for fence posts and for um you know things like you know, like shingles and stuff like that so it's not going to rot away while it's growing back to its full canopy again so again maybe in that regard they are um resistant you know another tree that's if, if you know norfolk pine which is a non-native it's very common in southern florida we have them in here in pinellas county too um, they were the only thing that survived Hurricane Andrew, really, like in the, in the direct path. But they survived as a telephone pole because all the branches busted off and then they re-sprouted and regrew. So sometimes with plants, sacrificing smaller parts for the sake of the whole is a survival technique. And those are the flowers that we were talking about earlier. Um, Jacaranda, a non-native from um, South America, flowers during the... the like the spring around May, um, very beautiful tree, but it has like this broad spreading um, shape of slender branches, which just makes it a nightmare when wind hits it. It just wasn't, the, it didn't evolve an area that has winds like we do, and it, it shows, right? Um, Laurel oak, um, the, I, we were talking about these trees before. They, they get a bad rap and not for, uh, not, not always unduly, but they aren't, terrible if you have one of these in your yard do not fear it if it's in good condition 
Um, they are a fast growing tree that has a short life, maybe 50 to 80 years, but we have a short life too, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when someone's, you know, 60, they don't want to plant a laurel because they, they, you know, they know it's not going to last 50 years. I, I call that person optimistic, really. Um, I, I, I love all trees. I do. And I think there's a place for everyone. And, and laurel oaks, there's a lot of places in cities that get tore up every 30, 40 years because of utilities and things underground. And maybe that's a place for them where you can get a big tree in a short time and then phase it out, you know? And if you have one in your yard, and you want to get rid of it, just know if it's a big tree, you're never going to get that back in your life, right? You're never going to get that shade, the experience back. Um, I mentioned before that the leaves here are a little bit flatter, more papery. You can see that, and if you can mentally contrast that with what you saw at the sand live oak. Uh, they have cute little round acorns, which I actually find endearing. Um, and then if you're trying to figure out what's the difference between a laurel oak and a live oak, Laurel oaks, if you have this in your backyard, you'll see these white spots, splotches and kind of smooth bark. Um, and the, that white banding shows up quite a bit, quite consistently in in, um, in, in the wild and in the backyard. Um, another tree that gets a bad rep for having the same kind of live fast, die young kind of mentality, you know, they just live it to the fullest, really hit it full speed, are water oak. Um, another species that does really well in poor wet soils and compacted soils, but it um, falls apart after 50 to 80 years. And when I say falls apart, trees, whenever they're injured, they have to put up barriers to prevent them from decaying. Kind of like our, your tooth can decay, so can trees. And some trees do this really well and can wall off an injury because that injury is there for the entire life and they have to grow around it. Well, these do not. They hollow out. The multiple wounds will coalesce into one big decay column, and they will hollow out. But that said, I mean, we use hollow tubes all the time in in construction. So the, the, as long as you have a sufficient outer shell, um, these things can be pretty safe. Mexican fan palm. Um, this is native to like the Baja Peninsula and, and Southern California brought here because it, it's it's a beautiful glossy um canopied palm you know and it can grow pretty big and you can see why this thing could have trouble right like um the ultimate tree that'll never blow over in the wind will be something stout and low but you know stout and low doesn't give you light when you compete with others and and so these things grow tall because they had competition with each other out in in the desert and they blow over here. Another cool thing, you know, these things are armed. You can see the the cool red thorns on the petiole. Um, they have a, a cool white flower as well. Um, the, what I like about these is if you go out west, these things look like cousin it from Adam's family. They'll have like a, a ruffled skirt going all the way down to the base because they're in a desert and all their dead leaves persist for for de uh, for decades, right? Um, when you get them here in Florida, we have such a humid climate that they rot off, and so we have to prune them off, and we have a clean, clear trunk here. So you could be in different parts of the country and see this exact same species and be completely full, fooled by it. Uh, what about other trees? So you may be wondering, like, okay, I didn't see my species in my yard. How do I know if it's safe or not? And And... That's something arborists have to deal with every day. They have to assess trees um, for clients, and we have so many gaps in the data. I, I'll work my whole career trying to fill them. My grad student who was just hired full-time at UF will work his full career, and we will never get this data for every single species. But we can look for other clues, right? Um, Southern magnolia, bald cypress, black gum, American holly. What do you see here that's similar? It's the form, right? They have a naturally excurrent, a naturally up and down form, which um, folks in <laughs> folks in um, the the ice storm literature have also noted is a very strong form. Um, it's not saying that that if you don't have that form, you're um, not going to. Um, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, I usually schedule these when I don't have kids, and I totally blanked on it because of the holidays so um so if, if you can see here 
uh, they have a very excrement form. And if you don't have that, it doesn't mean that your tree is not safe, but a tree with this will be stronger than the exact same species that doesn't have this form, right? So when we when we plant new trees, when we have them in our yard, we can we can give them this shape if they don't naturally have this. A lot of species that grow in cl in close proximity to one another in a forest will be very up and down because they're going straight up for the light. Once they're once you remove that competition for light around them, it's a feast on all different sides, and they start growing in every direction, trying to maximize their light capture, and that's where these problematic forms can occur. Um, from a wind point of view, you know, they're pretty, they look great, but if you, if wind's a concern, you, you want to try to get that up and down form. And, and you can do that through structural pruning where you actually select the main tallest branch and then you hobble the competition, the other competing branches by just cutting them back to another secondary branch. And these branches, they, they are fighting each other for light. The main stem doesn't care which ones make it and which ones perish from just being shaded out by their peers. It's just like go out there in all directions and let the, the strongest win. And you can pick the strongest ones and make that tree grow in the form you want through selective pruning. Um, improper pruning. So that was, that's what you want to do. And if you do this when the tree is young, the pruning you need to do when a tree is older is minimal, right? You're, when In that case, you're just looking for broken and dead branches, essentially, um, when the tr if you've done this pr pruning early on. Um, things that you don't want to do is what we call topping. And I this I took this picture last year. It still happens. Um, we've been saying this is a bad bad um, technique for a long time, but people continue to do it. It's it's new folks in the field. Anyone with a chainsaw on a truck can become an arborist, but it takes knowledge and skill to be a professional. And um, they will just cut to a predetermined shape to make the tree smaller because smaller trees are inherently less scary to folks. And this person didn't even do a good job. They left two big branches kind of going up to the sky. Um, the problem with this, and I have this in my parking lot that our landscape crew did in my condo, is that you're starving that canopy and that canopy is gonna shoot up tons of sprouts trying to capture back light, sending that food factory back up. And then at all those sprouts are gonna be at, at branch ends that are decaying, you know? And, and in, in five or six years, you're going to have these, you know, eight foot branches that are going to be prone to failure when the wind storm hits. And that branch is big enough to take out a window in a car, you know. Another thing that people do is lion's tailing, which is, you know, if you think if you're in a sailboat and you get in heavy winds, one of the things you can do is just pull down the sail a little bit and and have less sail area, right? And so the, the mindset with this pruning is, if I give the tree less sail area, it's gonna catch less wind. Um, unfortunately, the easiest branches to cut are the ones closest to the base of the tree. And those are the ones you wanna leave in place because those things crash back and forth in each other. When the tree goes this way, there's a branch going this way and they cancel out a lot of motion. If you, when you, when you take those out, you have, you reduce what we call mass dampening and the thing starts swaying back and forth because all the weight is all the force is being put way out on the ends of the branches and they're very slender because all the small branches that were feeding them and making them bigger are gone. So you, we have failures because of this. Hurricane pruning on palms. You know, this was meant to make the same thing, less sail area, but these things will just crash into the terminal bud and kill a stem. Um, researchers down in so Fort Lauderdale have noticed this in their work. Um, and why would you pay someone for less of a tree, you know, like people pay landscapers money to just give them less of a palm. These are two palms in the same city. One's in a golf course where they don't do any pruning. And look at how good those things, they look straight out of like the Lorax movie, right? And then this other, you know, person is paying someone good money to just keep pruning, pruning and pruning. And this actually reduces the health of the tree because um, you're stealing nutrients the tree is taking up right the, the trees expends energy to take up nutrients put in the green material and when the leaves die naturally it takes all that back and puts it in the trunk and puts it towards new growth so when you're cutting off green leaves you're, you're starving the tree for nutrients uh, at least for palms that is and palms tend to be the neediest thing when it comes to nutrients in your whole property if you're going to prune keep it below 
the nine to three o'clock mark. And you can still cut a lot of green if, you're, if your landscaper wants to feel like they're earning their money. Honestly, I would tell them just cut the brown things off, but if, if they want to cut some green, keep it below nine and three. Um, another, re so we talked about the up and down X current shape being why um, a lot of these trees are resistant. Well, another reason is the wood strength. We use oak for flooring. Uh, we use hickory for handles. I just had a picture of muscle wood because I was interested in, in what it looks like. Anything that has a tight grain like that, and is a very hard wood, is dense and resistant to, to breakage. And that's why live oak can break all the rules and grow like an octopus and still survive storms. And plus, they kind of they kind of make a dome that goes to the ground that kind of like it's almost like a turtle shell, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, and, and these, this wood is so strong that they made, they, they went kind of crazy once and they made a boat called the USS Constitution. Instead of just making like the main frames of the live oak, they started making the actual planks that made the hull. And this was the original ironclad ship, you know, they were facing a British fleet that was aged and, and, you know, rotting and the cannonballs would just bounce off this boat and it became just like. A legendary ship because of that, you know, and because the live oak was just so dense that it resisted breakage. So you saw a laurel oak, you saw that it was problematic. You have a laurel oak in your yard. Does it need to go? <laughs> Should you be scared at night? And and people are scared. This is an article that was in uh, Better Homes and Gardens. No, this old house, this old house. And it was about a couple who had like one tree in their backyard fall over and they proceeded to cut down every single tree next to it that did not fail because they were afraid of it. And and, and I, I find that problematic, you know, because most trees don't fail in storms. Most For most trees, the benefits that they offer outweigh any risk that they have. Trees do so much for us. This is the infographic we did for Tampa where we're, they talk about they store carbon, which we need, you know, because, we I mean, we had global fire records across the world this year you know they they provide food biodiversity and habitat they're beautiful like we talk no one talks about this from the science community but they're beautiful and that's why people like them right shading cooling property value um storm water abatement and attenuation right they do all of this and it's it's valuable we did a, a statewide canopy analysis of all the metro areas in the state and our trees and our urban areas they, they prevent $605 million in healthcare costs for respiratory illnesses, which is kind of important in the COVID world, right? They, they, they keep, they allow 50 billion gallons of water to slowly infiltrate on the site, which is the same as 75,000 swimming pools in a given year. They sequester and store the same amount of carbon as 15 coal fired power plants or 6.8 million homes in their heating and cooling demands or 6.7 billion cars, you know? The collective good that trees do, if we just leave them and do not cut them, which is where we release all the carbon right back to the atmosphere, is, is important. You know, I, I got into risk assessment and like the, my main crux of my, my research is risk assessment because when my firstborn, who was one of the few kids who's not showed up on this call, um, when she was born, I was working at a nonprofit and a, a lady was walking in the Brooklyn Zoo and a or Central Park Zoo and a branch fell and killed her baby right in her arms, you know? And and it struck me. And I just, I, at that moment, I said, I knew I was going back to school. And I'm like, if I can prevent this sort of thing from happening, if I can prevent this loss of life from happening, um, I would have a worthy career, right? But over the years, I've realized that trees have way more to fear than we have uh, from them. You know, they're killed out of fear, more likely than they're going to cause any damage. You know, tragedies like that one I just mentioned are in the news and they're making national headlines and, and NPR is ringing on the phone and everything like that because they are rare. Shark attacks are relatively rare, sinkholes, things that happen in Florida. But they, they capture our fear because we feel unaccustomed to them. They're natural. They're, they're sporadic enough where we don't see the patterns, right? Uh, but... Let's get some perspective on this. In a 13 year period, Thomas Schmidlin, a, a meteorologist from um, Case, uh, from Ohio, um, Kent State, Kent State, he found that 407 people 
died in a country of 330 million from tree related uh, failures. And if you are a woman on the call, it probably wasn't you. It was a man who should have known better and gotten out of a, a windstorm. <laughs> um, so it's not even equal across all demographics is what I'm trying to say. In that same time period, 646 people died from bees in the US. 8,000 people died riding a bicycle, something that's supposed to be a healthy activity, right? And I, I love the bike. Um, half a million people died in the car, which we put up with the tremendous risks that cars pose in our lives because they have tremendous benefit. And the same thing with trees, they have a benefit and they have a risk and, and, and that benefit should outweigh the risk in most cases. And then we talk about benefits and risk in that same time period where 407 people died from trees, 5.5 million people died in our country from smoking related deaths, which what is the benefit there, right? So I'm gonna move a little bit faster because I'm um, getting too much in the weeds, but I will say that we did some studies in Charleston, so in Savannah and Tampa, during tropical storms. You can see here that um, we we have low diversity. We have you know four species making up the vast majority of our species. So again, we don't wanna select purely for wind tolerance all the time and, and limit our diversity, um, but water oak and laurel oak, um, Nearly half of them had some sort of branch or tree failure, you know. But when you look at that, out of over 2,000 trees in the study set, the number of whole tree failures, the ones that get on the news, that show up on your news feeds, 1% of the trees, right? 6% of the trees had branch failures. And I don't think any of these caused any property damage or injury. It was just the tree failed and failed to hit anything, right? Because you, you to have... A risk, you need a tree, you know, a tree that's going to fall, a tree that's going to fall and hit a target, and then the target has to be there and get injured, right? There's so many things that have to occur that just failure alone is not, not risk, right? We did that in Tampa as well. Um, this was a little stronger storm, and we had seven trees that had full tree failure, and we had um, 80 trees that were intact. So the vast majority of trees, even in the stronger storm, had... Uh, no problem. And even whole tree failure in this case was not the whole tree falling. It was enough branches falling out where removal was warranted. So, so you see this, you're like, okay, so maybe the, the laurel may be okay, but how do I know if it is safe or not? And when in doubt, always, always talk to professional. So um, first things first, what can your tree hit? This was a tree that was in kind of by Ballast Point in Tampa. It was on a very... Um, large property very uh, well-to-do owner and they just bought the property i think they just wanted to see the, the bay honestly but they wanted this tree cut down because they were afraid of the risk right um and the, the city they knew that it was in the top one percentile for trees it was one of the biggest trees in the city based on all the data that they have and they were trying to convince the owner that maybe given that this tree just survived hurricane irma without dropping a branch they could keep it you know and the owner was like, I don't feel safe. I, you know, and, and I just want it cut down, you know? And the reality was the only person that was going underneath this tree was the landscaper once a week, right? But the, they, they just, they, they couldn't handle that risk. And the, the, it, it wouldn't, it, the landscaper is not gonna be mowing the lawn during a hurricane when the tree is most likely to fail, right? So if you have a tree that has a really big wound like this, but it's in your back 40 or not you know, gonna hit your house or the neighbor's house and you like it, it's not gonna fail when you're underneath it most likely, right? Because trees fail during wind events, during snow loading events, they do sometimes fail on blue sky days, but those are even rarer cases, right? And then you have to think, even if there is a target, like if it's a tree that I park under, are you gonna be parking there during a hurricane? Or are you gonna be evacuated, right? Um, I have some trees that were poor and poor, or pruned poorly in my, my right over my car. And when there's a hurricane, I just moved my car. <laughs> For Ida, it was in the guest parking that has no tree near it, you know? Um, or, you know, if you, um, if you, it's a tree that your kids love to play under, your dog likes to play under, um, are they going to be playing during a thunderstorm? You know, uh, that, that's, that's the thing. So, uh, things to look out for, 
um, that our big concerns are dead branches that are just in the canopy. These are things that are easy to spot. Just knock them down, cut them down with a pole saw, get up arborists that are tall, too tall to cut them out because they will fail in the short term. And a branch could hurt someone if it's in a targeted area, right? Uh, big wounds and cavities that break that outer wall. You know, a hollow tube is strong, but a hollow tube that has a hole in it on one of the, the walls is not. Trees that are leaning over that used to be straight. Um, trees that are girdling, have girdling roots or um, circling roots. Uh, usually from container production, these things just were allowed to grow too long in the pots and all the roots circle around. And now instead of being spokes on a wheel and holding the tree upright, they are a ball and socket joint and that thing will just blow right over. Um, and then, you know, things that have root decay. So this, this tree right here, you can see it has some decay fungus in the roots. You can see the fruiting bodies and you can also see the canopy above it is dying back. Um, canopy dieback is often a sign that something's going on below ground, given the connections between the above ground and below ground. So when in doubt, hire professional arborists. I recommend ISA certified arborists. Um, these are professionals that have a voluntary certification with a, a, a testing program and a tree risk assessment qualification is another qualification that they can have. I if you're doing risk assessments, I would go for the tree risk assessment qualified certified arborist. Um, our research shows that they just tend to be a little bit more on the nose with their research. And we've done studies where we have like 300 arborists assess the same trees. So, um, and then if you like the pictures today for the species, um, they're all from a book that we put together, which is Trees North in Central Florida. This is, I, I moved down here from Illinois and the only tree that followed me was red maple, actually bald cypress too. Um, so I had to learn all the species and I bought every single book that had Florida caribbean the south in it and and i needed something with pictures i love pictures i i don't like to read i read for i get paid to read um so having a very visual guide that practitioners could use that's organized um from a novice's point of view um and includes invasives natives and non-natives because the most common species in tampa is brazilian pepper and you should be able to see what it is know what it is even if you just want to cut it out, right? Um, that was important to me with this book. So, and with that, I am done. Thanks. And uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much for your time and sorry for the, the bomb. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, really appreciate all that stuff. And I disagree uh, with your daughter. I think that trees are pretty interesting. Apparently his daughter said that trees are boring, but uh, you you've made this quite interesting. So we have a question here from one of our viewers. My favorite tree is a flatwoods plum. I believe it's closely related to Chickasaw plum so much that it can get confused for it. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I wish I, <laughs> I was going to put a flatwoods plum in there and I would have like a comparison. I, I can't off the top of my head tell you the defense, but um, there, there are some key tells, and I can, I can look those up and send them to you. Sorry. That's okay. Yep. Um, ben noted that, uh, yeah, red cedar is pretty prone to loose branches, and the bigger trees, the bigger the problem. And he's got a big one that gives him lots of firewood every storm. Yeah, well, you could do something else with that. You could just put it in your closet. You know, keep the moss at bay. <laughs> um, be creative with that. That's valuable wood. You know, so. Um, Gwyneth also asked, have you ever seen a, um, the old growth longleaf pines with wounds from where it was slashed by turpentine harvesters? No. Where, where, is there a, a site that you would recommend? Because that would be interesting to me. I love that kind of the culturally significant trees, like the marker trees that, you know, Native Americans had used uh, for footpaths and stuff like that. I, I think that's great. Well, if anybody out there who's watching knows of where some of those trees are that have wounds from that, please send that information to us. Um, ah, here we go. It said Google cat face pine. Okay. Yeah, if, you, if you'll Google cat face pine, then uh, maybe you'll find that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There we go. We had another one from, oh, yeah, from... I think Athena and I are running over each other. Um, 
said that uh, I've heard that growing trees in groups can provide root stability and help tipping up, help prevent tipping over. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, imagine if you had um, one of, okay. So the way I, I'll, I'll explain this. So like one of the best ways you can stabilize a new tree is to put giant wooden staples in the root ball because you're, you're, um, letting the tree sway normally. So it's growing like really stable above ground, but you're anchoring those new roots that are coming out of the nursery right into the ground, right? Well, if you have a crossing root that is going, um, you know, from another tree over that tree, it's going to be the same process. You're keeping that root system from lifting and the whole thing will kind of slip if you have enough force um, with the soil in a good way. So you're just kind of anchoring it down with, with each other. Uh, and it's something that we have to take. We do a lot of pulling experiments. We pull trees over after we've done injuries to the roots that you would construct. And we have to make sure that none of those crossing roots are in there when we do our studies because they'd be kind of an artificial aspect and that every single tree in our study block. Now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Gail uh, says that you didn't mention winged elm. It's a uh, vase shaped, it's got gorgeous bark, uh, great looking leaves. Is it very strong? Yes, yes it is. It was one, um, I, that was just an omission because I was running out of time um, in the slide presentation, but it's it's a good species. I love the, the winged appendages, you know, mm -hmm. um, gives it kind of a, a unique, I love things that my kids and, and folks can like touch and see and makes, you know, kind of makes trees real for them. And that didn't work on all of them apparently. Um, and and that's one that's good for that. They they are a little messier, so they you can you can prune them to really clean them up and make them look nice. But if anyone split um, homeward, it's it's a test and patient. So very kind of a uh, contorted brain pattern and a tongue wood. So. Cool. Um, Gwyneth found the uh, YouTube that has uh, some of the. Um, pines that have been wounded for turpentine so cool. this is the uh that's the youtube link right there i will force my kids on a walk <clears throat> all right yep and uh gail mentioned earlier when uh athena was talking about red cedars that she's got a bunch of baby eastern red cedars all over her property so you bring the shovel and manpower and you bring your own uh dirt and pots and you can take them away yeah, and they, and they make a good yeah. head species too, so or a screen for neighbors. Although whenever you use mm -hmm. a tree to screen neighbors, it never grows fast enough in my, <laughs> my experience. So, yep, that's true. Yep. So if anybody out there wants some uh, red cedars and is willing to do a little bit of work for it, contact Gail. Um, I've I've noticed in my neighborhood that there's um, one neighbor who has a bunch of fairly small live oaks growing. And when I say fairly small, I'm talking about each of the trunks are only about this big, maybe this big. So they're really not very big yet, yeah. um, but they're in a stand. But because they're all crowded together, um, the ones on the edge are growing very horizontally, you know, because they're really looking for the light. Yeah, um, yeah. Because that's a single tree out of a bunch of others is that are those ones that are on the very edge going to end up having a problem or do you think that those will end up you know 100 years from now growing up to be just fine well edge trees in general tend to be the strongest in a stand because they're the ones that are facing the winds right hmm. so they they are growing um in, in at least partial exposure and if those ever go then the trees that are remaining, these they tend to be the ones that fail, actually. So whenever you buy in a wooded lot, um, if they just leave a few trees that used to, and it used to be like a full canopy lot, whatever's left will not have the taper that it needs for that exposure of wind. And you know, it, like you saw that one picture where it was like the big live oak. Eventually, if anything happens, it's gonna fall one way. It's gonna fall the way it's grown out, right? And it. it if it's growing out horizontal, it's not going to drop far before it hits the ground. And I think it's going to just pick up it now. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. Like, I wish uh, it's not going to happen again. And as these things die out and we continue to be in an urbanizing state, we're going to lose those, you know? Yep. All right. Uh, does anybody else have any questions that you want to put up on the comments section there? 
All right. Well, thank you for um, a very interesting presentation. I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes and I've got a bunch of trees I want to buy now. Okay. So uh, that kind of that kind of goes back to um, to our audience there. If you are willing to work at our plant sale, please contact us and let us know that uh, we have a volunteer force that would be able to um, facilitate a plant sale. And remember to um, RSVP if you want to go on the like and walk with Ben. He's got six slots open so far. All right. So thank you, everybody much Andrew for joining us. Um, really great information, nice presentation, and hope everybody has a great 2021. See you in February. Okay, thanks thank you so much. Take care.